Uh, hello, bonjour, bonjour. Um, welcome to the third webinar in our fall marketing series, which is Planning Your Market Part 2. And just to share with you a little bit about LFFC, um, we engage with over 90 food and farm co-ops across Ontario. We're involved in a wide variety of projects that are all aimed to support our member cooperatives to grow and to source more high quality products from producers across Ontario. The first presenter that we're gonna hear from is Jessica Kelly. And Jessica is the Direct Farm Marketing Specialist with the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. She provides business-related support to people selling agri-food products through all kinds of direct consumer marketing channels, including farmers markets, on-farm markets, CSAs, and agritourism. Prior to joining the ministry, Jessica studied business, agricultural economics, and international development. And Jessica is also involved with her family hog farm in Perth County. So I will turn it over to Jessica. So today we're going to be talking a little bit about costing and pricing. Um, what I'm going to talk about is really some very uh, some sort of base fundamentals when it comes to sort of approaching uh, some of this these calculations and analysis that should be done. Um, so often I run into people who kind of uh, feel this way about numbers. They're looking for 619 at the hotel and they just don't know which direction to go and they don't even know where to start. So that's sort of the focus of, of my portion of the presentation is really some basic fundamentals. A lot of these things you could do like back of the napkin kind of math we like to call it. You don't necessarily need you know, extensive uh, technology skills or spreadsheet skills to do a lot of these things but some good sort of fundamental uh, approaches and techniques to use when looking at costs and price. So uh, throughout this presentation, I'm going to sort of draw upon a little, little case study. So the essence of the case study is essentially, um, we've got a farm family in Norfolk County that started growing some strawberries. They were quite successful selling them at a local farmer's market. They decided to add value and, and they wanted to extend their season. So they started making their strawberries into jam. Um, last year, their strawberry crop failed. So they bought strawberries from another farmer um, to maintain their customers. Um, they've really continued to expand this jam business. They've now started producing in a commercial kitchen. They've invested in labeling, complete with a nutritional facts table so that they can sell through a number of different market channels beyond the farmer's market. And now they're trying to figure out where to go from there and what opportunities they might want to consider. From a very basic level, we're going to start off with, you know, what are some, some preliminary cost exercises you should do with a new product such as this? Um, so first we often look at what we would call variable costs. So these are costs that vary based on your output or production. So they're the things that could fairly easily be described in a per unit manner. So per jar of strawberry jam, per pound of beef, you know, whatever your product might be. So um, please don't get hung up on the values because if you develop, if you produce this product, you probably know these costs far better than I do. Uh, but these are just an example to work through. So some variable costs that you would consider for this type of product, your raw inputs, so your strawberries, your sugar, your pectin, um, your packaging, your jar, your lid, your label, um, and then your production labor. One thing, that, one thing I always like to emphasize with people is um, the, the importance of looking at all your costs associated with labor. So when I'm talking about production labor, these would be the people that are directly involved in making the product, um, growing the strawberries, if you're in fact growing the strawberries yourself, or making the actual jam, doing the washing and the, and the production of the jam. But often people will say, oh, you know, I'm paying those people $12 an hour, and then they do the math based on $12 per hour, the number of hours it takes to make a batch, breaks that down per jar, and say that that's the cost of their labor. Uh, what they often forget are things like, as an employer, you're not just paying you know, $12 an hour, you're also paying employment insurance, EI, you're playing your pension plan, your CPP, you're playing your um, WSIB premium. So you need to make sure you include all of those costs um, when you're looking at labor, not just the hourly wage that you're paying to an employee. And then we look at things like fixed costs. Um, so these are things, uh, costs that are independent of production levels. And sometimes people get hung up on the name fixed because they'll look at it and say, well, my utilities costs, that can change over time. Absolutely, it can change over time. Or your insurance costs can change over time. But the reason we call them fixed is that 
Um, it's not that they can't vary, they can vary and they will vary, but they don't necessarily vary in a direct relationship to the number of jar, uh, j jars of jam, sorry, that you're producing. So it typically stays fairly consistent within a range of production. So for example, if we looked at the first item there, if you're renting a facility, um, you know, that will cost that amount, in this case, $1,080 per year. You, you know that you can produce a certain number of jars of jam from that facility for that amount of time. And then if you needed to expand beyond that, you might actually see your rent go up by 50% because you need a whole, you know, extra facility. Maybe it'll double because you need twice as much space. So it's not that they can't change, but they tend to be fixed within a certain range of production. So in fixed cost, you might have things, in our example, things like, uh, rental, in this case, a kitchen rental, utilities, waste removal, product, non-production labor. So this is any labor involved in your farm or your business that's not directly related to the production. So this could be people doing sales and marketing. This could be your, your bookkeeper, could be you as a manager if you're not the one directly making the, the jam yourself. It might include things like promotions. In this example, it would include farmer's markets expenses. So in there, vendor stall fees, that types of thing, those types of things, um, insurance costs, property taxes, and things like depreciation on uh, any assets that you might have. Um, a couple things that I'd like to highlight here, um, the, the first would be that insurance piece. We always emphasize to people, particularly uh, people that you know, maybe in the past have been a farm that was only selling uh, products to you know, for further processing, you weren't necessarily selling food products, that if you're switching gears and you will now be selling food products, either direct to consumer or through other marketing channels, you really need to have a conversation with your insurance provider to make sure that you still have the appropriate insurance coverage if you're now going to be selling food products as opposed to, you know, raw agricultural products that are being used for further processing. Another one I'd like to highlight is the, the property taxes. This is a bit of a caution here, um, particularly for those people that are doing uh, either production of some type of value added product or sales on their farm um, to pay attention to this property tax piece. Um, so adding diversified activities to a farm property can have significant impact on the property tax assessment. Um, and that's all done to, through the Municipal Property Assessment Corporation. So unfortunately, every few years, we seem, there seems to be a story in the media uh, of a farm that all of a sudden um, has a significantly larger property tax bill than they had anticipated because a portion of their farm was um, sort of reassigned from agricultural to, to commercial or another use. Um, we don't expect or anticipate those costs, so we do always encourage people to, to do some research in that regard so that they're not surprised by a big tax bill that they weren't expecting and they weren't uh, planning for when they're looking at, for example, how to cost and price their products appropriately. With any of these costing exercises, you know, we always talk about the importance of, you know, knowing your cost of production, and I like to warn people against something that I call farmer math. Um, or entrepreneur's math, and you know you're guilty of this if you're making comments like, but I'm not taking a wage, or we were driving to town anyways. So farmer math looks something like this. Your product costs $20, then you spend a bunch of time on it, and then you drive it to a restaurant or a customer or a farmer's market, and in your financial calculations, you still identify that product as costing you $20. Um, that is not a sustainable way to estimate cost and the purpose of, of basing prices upon them because you're missing out on the cost of operating your vehicle and the value of your own time. Um, so we always like to remind people that in order to build a sustainable business, when you're looking at costs as a basis for where to set your prices, you need to remember that your time has value. If you weren't spending your time you know, in this, in in your farm or in your business, you could be doing something else. You could be earning a living elsewhere. You could be volunteering. You could be, you know, taking up some new wonderful hobby. Um, but you need to make sure you account for that time uh, and put a value on it, it so that you base your prices accordingly. And often people will say to me, um, you know, but I'm a new business owner. You know, I'm not expecting to pay myself a salary or any type of wage until you know, five years down the road. That's great. But, and, that, and that's reasonable, and that's, that's good that you have that expectation and understanding of what, sort of what's realistic. But if in year one, you're setting your prices for your products based on your costs, if you don't put anything in there, any cost for your own time, 
five years from now, there aren't, isn't magically going to be money that just appears for you five years down the road. You need to account for that and budget for that money that you want to have later in your prices today. And remembering that, you know, using a vehicle has a cost, even if they have a different primary purpose. Um, my, own, my own family is guilty of this. Uh, my brother-in-law used to uh, live about an hour away from where we live in Guelph, and he would drop pork off to restaurants on his way home from work, is what we used to say. Um, we didn't charge those restaurant customers any delivery charge. We didn't give any thought to, you know, what a minimum order should be to justify a trip to Guelph because he was going anyways. Um, and then he moved. And then all of a sudden, if we wanted to maintain those customers, we were going to be out a lot of time because we were going to have to make a special trip to make those deliveries. Okay. So that was a nice coincidence, but a sustainable business isn't normally built on coincidence. So if you've gone through the exercise of coming up with your variable and fixed costs um, for a product, you can then look at something that we call break even. Uh, I think most people know sort of in a colloquial manner what we mean by break even. So it's essentially a point where your revenue equals your expenses, so you're not making a profit or and you're not making a loss either. So this is the point where your sales are enough to cover not only your variable costs of producing your jam, let's say for our case study purposes, but also those fixed costs. It's also enough to cover your insurance and your rent and your utilities and your, your non-production wages. So here's just a sample calculation of how we could calculate break even in this instance. So we're assuming that for our case study, they're selling their strawberry jam for $8 per dollar at the summer's market. So the break even there, we take our total fixed costs. So that was um, taken from the earlier slide that was some of all those items. We take the fixed cost and we divide it by essentially our contribution margin or our gross margin per unit. So it's the $8 that we're selling it for minus 71 that we calculated each jam jar would cost us to make. And that tells us that we need to um, sell 1,800 jars of jam to be at that magical point where we don't make money and we don't lose money. Um, this calculation, of course, looks very easy and simple when you're selling one single product, which is not normally the case. So if you were to adapt this um, for another situation where you're selling multiple products, um, you have to come up with either a sort of weighted gross margin, uh, sort of contribution margin for your denominator or use a percentage. You know, if, if you can look across all your products and it's typically, you know, a 30 or 40 percent gross margin, you could use a percentage there um, instead. And then instead of your output, your answer being in terms of a number of units, it would be a dollar sales figure instead. So that's how that one could be adapted. Um, there's another tool I wanted to mention, and I saw this um, concept. It's not uh, particularly um, revolutionary by any stretch of the imagination, but I saw it presented by um, someone who works for Farm Credit East uh, in the United States with direct farm marketers, and, and she um, really, really highlighted it as an important thing to do. So what you see there on the left is essentially what most most of us would have if we spit out our QuickBooks or whatever, um, our bookkeeping software is what we would, if we asked for an income statement, we would get something like that. You have your income, you have a whole bunch of expenses lumped together, and then you have your profit or loss at the bottom. So in this instance, um, in this example, they have a loss of $62,000 at the end of the year. Sort of that, those three big chunks. And what she was encouraging and what I try to encourage people to do, is to take that essentially three line income statement and turn it into a five line income statement. You're taking that big chunk of expenses and trying to separate it into your variable costs. So your things that are directly relatable to what you're producing, what you're selling, and then those more fixed costs or, or overhead type costs. So then you end up with sort of five line system. So your sales, you subtract your variable costs or your COGS, then you get that gross margin and then you separate out your fixed costs before you get to your profit. <clears throat> Now, the value here is that it just provides you a little bit more information. So if we look back on this previous slide, the company had a loss of $62,000. It's very hard from what we see here to diagnose the problem there. Whereas if we break it into a five-line income statement, one of two things will be true. Either we have a negative gross margin and a negative profit, or we have a positive gross margin and a negative profit. And even those two different scenarios can tell us a little bit more about the situation and how to diagnose it. 
So if the gross margin is positive, that means that on our individual, you know, sales of jar uh, of jam jars, we're making money on individual jars, but we're essentially not selling enough jars to then cover our fixed costs. So in that instance, our options are sell more to increase the number that we're selling in as a, re as a result, increase our sales and hopefully sell enough more that we can cover those fixed costs or alternatively somehow figure out how to lower, um, trim down those fixed costs so that you can make a profit. If you're in the second situation where both the gross margin and the profit are negative, that means that you have a pricing issue um, because your actual sales, every time you sell a jar of jam, your price is not enough to cover even the variable costs um, of producing that product. So just by essentially reorganizing our, our bookkeeping structure to get more information, you can learn more to help diagnose some of those um, financial and or pricing issues. So here's just an example, again, from our case study of what a five line income statement might look like. The other thing I've done with this five line income statement is added a second column that's a percentage. So this is just a simple vertical analysis. So each item is a percentage of sales. So the variable cost, 34% of sales, gross margin, 66% of sales, et cetera. Um, and the nice thing here is that it, it gives you another sort of comparison piece. So if you were to be comparing year over year, sometimes, especially if, you're, if your business is growing and changing a lot, it's hard to compare dollar value figures from year to year because things are changing and it's, it's just, it's not apples to apples. So sometimes comparing a percentage year over year is a better indication of how your performance is, is doing over time. Also, if you're lucky enough to have the opportunity to have other businesses uh, in the industry that you know that you can sort of do some benchmarking analysis with, having something like this, and your businesses might be different sizes or scales, but maybe something like comparing some of these percentage numbers um, is something that would be valuable and telling and would help you to learn from others uh, in the industry or others with similar businesses. So then switching gears a little bit from sort of that costing piece to more on the pricing side. So the first thing I wanted to talk about on sort of the um, the pricing piece is just one clarification around terminology that I that often people seem to get hung up on. Um, so that's distinguishing the difference between a margin and a markup. So in this example here on the slide, we have uh, our farmer business that's selling a product to let's say a retailer for $5. And that retailer is then turning around and selling that product to $10 for $10 to the end consumer of that product. Um, so the question is, you know, what's the margin for the retailer in this situation and what's the markup um, for the retailer in this situation? So margin is $5 or 50%. Markup is $5 or 100% which is confusing. How can something be $5 and be 50% and $5 and 100%? So I just wanted to walk through this calculation to show you the difference. So when we're talking about margin, the margin, if we look at just the dollar value difference, it's the difference between the $5 and the $10. That's where the $5 come from, comes from. The grocery retailer gets a $5 margin. But when we convert that to a percentage, we're looking at it as, um, as a percentage of the end uh, selling price. So it's essentially working backwards. So if you look at the calculation at the bottom there, we take the 10% that they're selling for minus the 5% cost to them. We divide it by the $10 price that they sold it for, and it's a 50% margin. So 50% of that selling price is theirs to keep um, as the sort of intermediary in this step. Mark up is based on cost. So again, the actual dollar figure gap is still $5. So $5 between what they bought it for and what they're selling it for. But when we do it on a percentage basis, the denominator is no longer the $10 selling price. The denominator is the $5 that they bought it for. So they're essentially, the 100% the 100, the 100 markup is an indication that they doubled the price. They increased, they took the cost they paid for and they increased it by 100% versus the margin, we're looking at what they sold it for and working back 50%. That's kind of confusing. That is not meant to overwhelm. Really the entire purpose of this slide is to remind people about the importance of precision um, 
in language that if you were to be talking with a retailer or a customer that you may be selling to, these two terms are not interchangeable. Um, they, do, um, they can mean different things, particularly if you're dealing with a percentage um, as opposed to a dollar value. Okay, so just a, a reminder there to be important to, to be um, diligent with your words and follow up on these two definitions if this is all new to you. Um, another piece that's really important when we're talking about pricing um, that can't go ignored is this, this reality of, of the volume and price dynamics. So this is particularly important when we're looking at opportunities across a range of different marketing channels. So the this graph I created from a, a tomato greenhouse that I visited and some of the financial pieces that they shared with me. So in their case, they showed, this is essentially the situation that they're dealing with. So the blue line represents if they sell all their tomatoes at retail price, the bottom axis is the access, sorry, is the pounds of tomatoes sold and the vertical axis is the gross margin. Whereas the sort of turquoise line that has a, a much flatter slope to it, that's if they sell all of their products at wholesale. So if they wanted to, let's say, have a $100 gross margin, they could either sell 50 pounds at retail or 200 pounds at wholesale, okay, to make the same amount of gross margin to then be available to help cover their fixed costs. So I think it's really important to, when we're talking about price costing and pricing, we can't leave volume out of the equation um, because depending on what market channel you're selling through, there might be different opportunities for volumes. You might be able to sell more through wholesale channels, but you're also going to be selling at significantly lower prices in most cases. So um, as an entrepreneur, as a farmer, as a producer, um, this, is, this is a risk that needs to be considered and a dynamic that needs some close consideration. And in talking to different producers, um, I've, I've heard different examples of um, how people manage this. So you know, one uh, producer told me um, that even if an entire field ripens at once, he's not going to pick it or have his staff pick it until it's sold um, because he's learned that, um, you know, picking a crop and letting it rot costs him more than just letting it sit in the field. Um, so, you know, that's something that he's learned along the way. I talked to a beef producer who told me that he learned that he never slaughters an animal until he has all the ground beef from that animal sold. Because in his experience, the ground beef was the hardest piece to sell. Um, so that was how he managed this, this sort of risk dynamic um, when it came to volumes and prices. One of the common questions we always get is sort of what is a reasonable price? Um, and if someone is, is doing direct, far, uh, direct to consumer sales, so selling at a farmer's market or through an on-farm market, I always encourage people to do some mystery shopping. You know, go around to, to some competitors, look for whatever your product is, look to see at the grocery store, a farm market, food festival, you know, what your product or your category of product tends to sell for. That's one really um, simple and really important way to figure out you know, what might be reasonable for your prices. Um, if you're selling through wholesale channels, that can be a little trickier. Um, there are some online resources. So there's a website called Organic Price Tracker. And then uh, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada has a horticulture wholesale price report that you can look at if you're selling unprocessed products. I also heard from a number of, um, I asked some, some chefs and some retail buyers. I said, you know, how should a farmer even begin to know what a reasonable wholesale price is for their product. And in many cases, they told me that, you know, if they had an interest in local product, they were, they were totally comfortable telling a farmer, you know, your product right now, this is what I could get that for at the Ontario food terminal or similar products to yours. That's what I could get. This is what I would have to pay right now to get that from my distributor or from my wholesaler. And a number of them said, I'm willing to pay a little bit more for local, but they need to at least be in the ballpark. So, um, you know, I'm happy to tell them kind of what my alternative options are for sourcing the product that, that you're offering. When we talk about prices, we, uh, you know, a fundamental framework that's a good basis for the whole discussion is, you know, the three C's of pricing. So what are customers willing to pay? What are competitors charging? And then what are your costs? So the costs we've been talking about throughout, and we'll continue to talk about you know, the competitor and the customer piece, that's where you need to do some of these research pieces. You need to talk to chef, 
the food buyers to figure out what the going price is for your product category, doing mystery shopping, that type of thing. With prices, it's also really important to talk about price variability um, throughout the season, perhaps, depending on supply, which is often impacted by weather, um, based on demand. Um, one retailer talked to me about what he called the tomato wall in August, which was essentially that time of year when everyone has tomatoes, everyone's neighbor has tomatoes. So he can't afford to buy really expensive tomatoes in his store because if you're getting free ones from your neighbor, you're not gonna buy expensive tomatoes at the grocery store. So he essentially said, during the tomato wall, my tomato growers need to expect that I'm gonna pay them less or they're gonna have, they're gonna have to expect a lower price for me during that time of year. Um, there's also a lot to be said if you're doing direct marketing for, for appropriate season seasonal pricing of products. I was recently speaking with some, some beef direct marketers and we were talking about not only the challenges of, of cutting up a carcass into seasonally appropriate cuts, but then also pricing them appropriately. So in the summer, having things that make more sense for people's barbecues. Um, so making sure you have those cuts, but that you price uh, accordingly. People are probably willing to pay more for a hamburger in June, July, August than they would be in February, more appealing on their barbecue than any other way. Um, so that's a, an interesting element when it comes to price variability as well. Um, the last point there about reasonable warning should always be given when prices are changing. You know, I think this this hopefully is common sense, but you know, if you're selling to a restaurant or a retailer, um, they expect some some predictability and stability with their pricing, and some stability in terms of the mechanism with which you communicate any pricing changes um, to them. I'm just going to skim through these quickly for the sake of time. So essentially what I'm doing on these last few slides is, is highlighting from our case study um, how they might take two potential business opportunities and then apply some of those tools we looked at earlier. So the first opportunity would be, you know, expanding beyond the farmer's market to sell jam to a restaurant. Uh, and the second is expanding beyond the farmer's market to sell to a local kitchen store that makes gift baskets and sells uh, gourmet food products. So in each case, um, there's a price that that customer is willing to pay. And in each case, the owners, Beth and Patrick, have estimated what they think their costs will be to facilitate that customer and, and to open up that new market. So, you know, break even in the tool that they might look at, you know, for each new opportunity, what are the new fixed costs associated with it? What are the new sales associated with that channel? What do we think will sell? What, what's, what's the price they're willing to pay? What's our cost to produce? How many jars of jam do we have to sell to make that worthwhile? And then comparing that to how much we actually expect those customers to order. A five line income statement is also a tool that can be used not only looking backward at past performance, but you could use it as a projection tool as well. So they could look at how their current farmer's market sales might stack up against what they expect to sell through two other new channels. And then it's important to remember that when making a decision about, um, you know, costing and pricing, there are, of course, financial considerations. A lot of them we've gone through, things like costs, price, uh, margins, volumes, break even, and income statements. But there also can be other um, non-financial considerations related to operations, marketing, human resources, uh, and control. So you know, if you're going to be selling, you know, through a retailer, um, and, and they then have the capacity to set the retail price, you know, but you're gonna to continue to sell at a farmer's market, how are you gonna work that arrangement? If your jam is gonna be, able, if you're gonna be selling at a farmer's market and someone else is gonna be selling the very same product in a store, do you want those product prices to be the same? And if so, you know, how, how will you try to facilitate that? So there's lots of non-financial considerations as well. Um, and another really important thing to highlight, um, is this concept that costing and pricing is an ongoing exercise. Um, so it's something that needs to be revisited on a, on a regular basis, um, just like business plans should be updated on a regular basis. Um, and the example that I'll give here actually comes from our own farm. Um, so again, we are pork producers and we work with a processor that along with some wonderful pigs, we like to think, makes some exceptionally wonderful bacon. And um, one of the great things about being farmers and food producers, as most people will know, is that we get to eat some really, really great food. But what that also means is we don't tend to buy those foods where 
normal people buy that same food product. So in my family, we rarely buy pork at the grocery store. And if you're a big fan of pork, you'll remember that a few years ago, all of a sudden bacon prices spiked in combination with bacon packages getting smaller. They went from a full pound to 375 grams. Our family wasn't buying bacon at the grocery store, so we were kind of oblivious to this whole change taking place. And all of a sudden, we discovered um, by accident, by a family member pointing it out to us, that our bacon that we thought was really an exceptionally good, high-quality premium product was now cheaper than no-name bacon at the grocery store because we had completely lost touch with prevailing market prices because it wasn't a product that we purchased on a regular basis. Okay, so cautionary tale about the importance of not only doing um, sort of this analysis about what pricing makes sense, but revisiting it on an ongoing basis um, so that you don't lose, leave money on the table or alternatively lose customers um, that you shouldn't have. So just a couple resources here, and I'm happy to um, email these out or share them because um, obviously this is, not, this is not the easiest way to uh, copy down URLs, but we do have some uh, some great cost of production information across uh, a huge number of crops and different livestock products done by a colleague of mine out of our Brighton office that are really great. And then from some other organizations, there are some good sort of one page business plan templates um, and budgeting databases, particularly for people who are not financially inclined, but know they, that they need to make a little bit more effort in terms of doing some careful planning in this area. 